So I, I, I didn't have a good background image for, for the start of the meeting, so I put this one up. Uh, I just wanted to show what a beast this has turned into from, from Harald setting up Sweden CPP here up in Stockholm to, to actually having it in multiple sites all over Sweden. It's a bit, a bit embarrassing for me coming from Gothenburg that there is no current Gothenburg event, but we're working on it. Uh, so in most major cities you actually have a C++ event, which is awesome. Um, this talk is, I'm not sure if I'm going to call it a bet, but it's a result of a, of a discussion and there is something sitting over there. And this came up in, in our Slack channel uh, among the organizers. Any Mac nerds here? Uh, and throwing away some junk. And, and Iris replied, me, me, me. <laughs> because I'm not only a Mac nerd, but a retro machine nerd. So if you have anything lying around, don't chuck it away, give it to me. Uh, I tried booting it. It would have been fun to show a demo on it, but the screen seems to be a bit flaky. So unfortunately, it only sits there and, and looks pretty. I was also recommended to take a proper carry-on luggage with wheels, since it's an older laptop, so it's luggable, but not portable as we're used to now, or we're weaker these days. Um, but I wanted to talk about how we came here. I mean, C++ 17, 20, and so on, it's all cool, but why, why are we here? I, I find it fascinating, personally, that a lot of the things that are seen as new today were actually meant in like the 50s, 60s. It's just that we have the, the cycles to actually try out the theories now. So it's, it's fun to look backwards. Um, yeah, some data about this machine if you're interested. It has four megs of RAM, which is amazing. I wished for that in the 90s. I had one meg and then you have to swap floppies a lot and so on. Um, where do we have the CPU speed? 25 megahertz, also amazing. An Amiga was eight megahertz. So I mean, it's, this is a fast machine. Um, the hard drive could be up to 120 megs, and I don't think you can buy that small SD cards anymore. Um, so things have changed. Um, some quick words about me. Um, I've been working with, uh, with C since mid 90s, uh, started with C++, 96, worked a lot with Qt. Uh, I did a short stint at Trolltech in Oslo for 10 months, and then the ELOP incident happened. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Qt has been a red thread through, uh, through my career. Uh, I also run some other meetups so around free and open source. So FOSSGBG and also a conference called FOSS North that happened two weeks ago. So the bold statement is remember this for next year. Uh, and currently I, I work in a company called Kuro Studio uh, where we work at digital transformation. Let us put it that way. How, how to do software development when you do a physical product. Um, so, some quick questions to you. I mean, I just picked some here. Someone here told me about their experiments with ABC80, uh, an amazing machine. I actually learned to code BASIC using the user manual of ABC80 because it was in Swedish, but I had a C64, so my dad had pains when I tried to. Some commands were missing. So, how many here are Amiga people or Commodore? And how many dare to say they're Atarians then? Ah, okay, we're three, four, good. <laughs> I'm not all alone. I work in Germany, then it's the other way around, which is good fun. So <laughs> there, there are strongholds for, for both of them. Uh, I find this part of history kind of interesting because there's a lot of variation. It, it's not a standard architecture. Uh, there's even different CPUs and so on in ordinary desktop computers. But if we go even further back, um, if you look into the C++ family of languages, um, the first braced language or with code blocks begin end was Algol and that's in 58. Uh, and that's a bit frightening because then you realize that what we find innovative is actually something has been going on for, for, what is it, 60 years of development. So, so nothing is new under the sun. Uh, a fun thing about Algol is that it's, uh, there are many different dialects and, and by today's standards the dialects almost looks like different languages. And it, it lacks a standard library, there is no standard way of doing I.O. and so on. But it, it's a language, it has the code blocks and it's the beginning of, of the C family of languages. Uh, and if you start reading about Kernighan and Ritchie and, and C, many people mention B and BCPL. 
as, as the key language, languages that sort of influenced it. Uh, and a guy called Martin Richards came up with this BCPL. Um, and it's actually portable, so it's good for bootstrapping of different systems. You write a small BIOS or a standard library backend, and then you can move your, your code forth and back. And, and now you start to recognize the braces um, if you're used to C, C++. It has only one data type it knows of, and that's words. Um, and this is, well, there were lots of Amiga and Atari people here. This is not the 16-bit word. This is the word, the, the bit depth of, of what the computer address is. Because we haven't in, even agreed on bytes yet at this point. So in, for instance, the PDP-8, which was quite popular, had 12-bit words. And that's what you address. You couldn't address on an 8-bit boundary, so to speak. So portable is a strong term, since you can have different word sizes and so on. Um, and then you have B. And, and now, some of you might start recognizing people in the photos. Um, this looks very C-like, I would say. Um, they, they do some interesting things. They introduce the dangerous coupling in there. If we would have kept these two, perhaps it would have been easier not to mess up in, in your clever little while loops and so on. Uh, A short question. When did Pascal enter the arena? I, I saw the Hmm, <laughs> I don't know, but uh, Wikipedia knows. <laughs> they know everything. Um, but probably later, I would guess. Um, it was later. Pardon? It was later. It was later, yep. Pascal is nice because it's easy to write Pascal compilers. That's all I know, because I've done that. Uh, this language still only had one data type. But then we actually come to to something that we recognize. So, so C in 72, which means that I still wasn't born. Um, this was developed alongside Unix. Um, and we had a computer, PDPL 11, that could address bytes. So we actually got different size data types and not only the words anymore. Uh, it didn't have function signatures, which is kind of fun. Um, this makes you happy for modern compilers. Um, so I mean, this, this is the example by the book. Um, but then disk space is expensive and keyboards were bad and so on. So there are a lot of things that are assumed. So int is optional. You can just say mine, main and you don't have to define arc C because it's an integer because you didn't say anything. Uh, sometimes. For some compilers, you always return zero if there is nothing else. So you can skip the return statement, and it works almost everywhere. Um, so, so you can get into really interesting error situations when you have compact K and RC, definitely. Uh, but this is also somewhere where I, I learned to understand a machine. So, so when you started here, usually you started with BASIC and, and the most available language after BASIC was your peaks and pokes, so basically machine code that you put into memory and you executed them because pixels didn't appear quickly enough in BASIC. And then you try C, so you want to map that onto, onto your understanding. And, and it's quite fun to see how a C call is made. And, and this is for x86. Um, so you push your arguments onto the stack, and then you make a call. Then you need to remember where you came from. And then you allocate space for your local variables. Now I don't have the code on this slide. Then you do your thing, and the function that was being called cleans up after itself. You do a return statement that pops this from the stack and goes there, and then the caller cleans up its half. Which means that it works fairly well without, uh, without function signatures, because you, you clean up after yourself. You get funky bugs, but the stack frame is somewhat intact, so you can at least start debugging and it doesn't go completely haywire. Um, this is one of the things that I liked with KNRC that has disappeared. Uh, and that was that you could actually see that the top half up here, um, you didn't declare the types in the signatures. You had to do that underneath. That's a part of the stack. And then the brace was basically your, your return address. And then you can see what you had on the stack there. So it was a very simple mental model for how a C call is made. And, and this is where I sort of 
fell in love in C because it's easy to integrate with other things because it has a very simple model. You can still shoot yourself in the foot, as I said, but it's fairly straightforward. Um, I didn't mention return values, and th this is fun. Uh, so again, looking at x86, you can do this in multiple different ways. So, so if it fits in this EAX, EDX CPU registers, where you have up to 64 bits, you can simply put your stuff in there. And, and that's returned to whoever called you. Uh, if you do floating point, um, you have a register or a simulated stack. I just realized that this is a screen and not a projection surface. Maybe I shouldn't point directly at it. Um, and you can also, if you return large stuff, you end up with actually doing that through a virtual heap, so to speak. You allocate the object and you point to the object, but there is no pointer in your C code. Please. I think it's up to call it to uh, space of a stack. Um, Pardon? I think, <coughs> if I don't remember uh, incorrectly, uh, it, it's the caller that makes space of the stack is done. The stack is still. Okay, so the caller allocates the space for the return value on the stack. If I remember correctly. It, it could be correct, yes. Um, but there, there are many different ways to do this, which, which means that it's, it's interesting. And, and it also means that you can't put stuff in these registers because the function is allowed to touch them and so on. Uh, something that I learned frighteningly recently is uh, that if you forget to return stuff, uh, you, you get whatever would happen to be in EAX. And if you have a really cool, large legacy code base, so hundreds and hundreds of warnings, you still should never ignore them because there is one warning in there that's actually causing this funky bug where the, the entire program behaves really strangely because the return value is not based on the function itself, it's based on whatever you happen to call before the function. One of the things that's important to, to realize here and why it's interesting with this cleanup uh, responsibilities between the different half, the caller and the callee and so on, is that you usually didn't have a memory management unit. So does that word mean anything to you? I see some nodding heads. So, so in, a, in a modern CPU, you have virtual memory for, for each and every process. So if you address, address 42 in different processes, it's a different physical address. So you have a memory mapping unit that makes sure that the local 42 address means an actual physical address that's different between the processes. Uh, if you look at that one, and, and prior to, to OS X, uh, they were known for not having this because if everyone shares the same memory space, a single application crashing can overwrite memory of all the other processes. So you can get very spectacular system-wide crashes instead of a single process going down. Uh, the biggest problem as a developer, even if you do things correctly, is that since you don't have a virtual address space, when looking at dynamic linking, so when loading a shared library, like a DLL or an SO file, uh, that cannot contain actual memory addresses because you don't know where it's loaded and you can't have a virtual space for it. So, so this is an example from, from Gemdos. Again, I raised my head for, for Atari. Uh, so you basically have a large table of addresses that are hacked live while the program is loaded. It changes the actual program code with the addresses that it calculates based on where it happened to load it. And, and just to go down memory lane a bit, so, so this is where I learned code C. Um, I had an Atari STE, enhanced, it could do 4096 colors as many as the Amiga, but we don't mention that. Um, I only could afford a floppy drive. I have a hard drive now. I could buy it before I turned 40. Uh, and I had a C compiler that came on seven floppies, including your project disk. So, so you had the compiler and the tools on one floppy, you had all the headers on one, you had the, the libraries on another one and so on. So, I mean, it, it's not a quick compile. We're not talking seconds here. We're talking physically shifting disks in and out seven times at least. So, so you really learn this. I mean, it, you mind your braces and your semicolons. You don't want to fail on something simple. And there's zero syntax highlighting. Please. So did people actually use this, or were they cross-compiling from a bigger system? I, th I would say the people probably had a hard drive if they worked professionally in it. 
But as a hobbyist, I mean, that was out of your league. I don't know how much a hard drive was back then. It was way out of my budget when I was in my upper teens, despite all handing out different newspapers and, and advertisements and stuff. Um, I don't think you cross-compiled. I think you worked locally. Um, I'm happy to say I'm too young to know. Um, but one of the things that I find fascinating, I mean, I showed all these different machines, you had all these different solutions to, to, because there wasn't a standard solution that had one yet. And, and it's kind of fun because you, you end up with what I call oddware, which is sort of what bridges us to, to where we are tonight, today. So, I mean, memory was really tight, floating point, you don't really have hardware support for it, you had to emulate it in software, so it was super slow, so who uses that? Uh, everything is an upgrade from assembly. I mean, that was your alternative if you wanted something quick. So either you write machine code or you use something high level and you don't really mind if it's that portable or not. So, I mean, there was a lot of interesting innovation there. And I put this one, this is fun. This is Xerox Park back in 82 or something. I mean, a GUI, a graphical user interface. This is what inspired Steve Jobs. The paperless office was their target. And I mean, Xerox still make copiers, so I don't know how well it went. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is where, how you teach kids like me when you're in your teens to do mind pointers, because it's a C interpreter with pointer support on a machine without memory protection. So if you fuck up, you actually fuck up your entire IDE or operating system, whatever else you happen to have running in there, so you really learn it. Uh, and I mean, the best way to learn is to make mistakes, they say, so that's how I learned a lot. <laughs> uh, it's such a strange idea that I think nobody would come up with it today, but it was actually quite popular back in the day. And you saved this seven floppy experience because it was an interpreter, it was live. Uh, you have other things like small C variants. Um, so small C is actually something that's still used today. Uh, you can use it for the, for the C64 CPU, Apple II and so on. They share the 6502 family. Uh, I think it's 6510 in the C64 and so on. Uh, it could also be used for, for Atari machines and Z80 machines like the Spectrum and so on. Uh, and it's actually a compiler for a subset of C. And, and if, you if you see how the assembler code looks, it really means that they just avoid everything that's complicated as a compiler maker. So there are no structs, no unions, nothing multidimensional, nothing beyond what you can do with a single pointer. Uh, there are no floating point numbers because then you have to write a floating point library. That's difficult. You also don't have size of or any kind of typecasting. You, of course, have pointers. You can still sort of make things look like other things, but the compiler won't help you. Uh, and you can only return an int. So, so they skip this whole problem of, of pre-allocating stuff when you call something large, for instance. Um, there are a surprising number of these families that are still around. Um, so, so if you're into old CPM machines, so we're talking late 70s, early 80s, there is something called BDSC. Uh, you have TinyC, which is actually ISO uh, C99 compliant. It's 100 kilobytes for the entire tool chain. So it's, it's very far from Clang and LLVM or, or GCC. Uh, this one I've used, LCC Win32. Uh, LCC is... Uh, is sort of the compiler and then it's been packaged for, for different parts. Uh, LCC Win32 then comes with Windows headers. Uh, there is a derivative called Pelles C, which I hadn't had time to look into. So I don't know, do we have any Pelle here? Because it's, it's a Swedish thing, but I've, I don't know who the Pelle is. Uh, but it's a derivative of that one and it's still alive. It's a live project. Uh, PCC, uh, Portable C Compiler, so from the mid 70s. Uh, actually from Bell Labs, so I mean, this, this is one of the old ones. That was popular on the Amiga, I do remember. Um, and then if you're hacking really small systems like Arduinos or, or even smaller things, you have this SDCC, the Small Device C compiler, which, which again is a live and used project. Uh, it's an open source compiler for, for really small 8-bit microcontrollers. So this is actually used. I mean, Clang, LLVM and so on, they target 
performance and and to s you can tune them to target size but not that size then we're talking kilobytes not megabytes so so then you need something different but we're at the uh, the cpp part so so what about the plus plus part uh, I have a really bad joke because that's what you end up with when you mix Norwegians and Danes. No offense, I say it with love. <laughs> uh, Ole Johan Dahl and Christian Nygaard, so uh, Norway, started Simula. Um, when giving a variant of this talk in Gothenburg, I learned that this is Simula 67 and not Simula because Simula was not object oriented. Uh, so they introduced these concepts, object classes, inheritance, subclasses, virtual procedures, and so on. They also had garbage correction and, and more things. So it, it did quite a lot. Um, and looking at this code, we can see that they define a glyph class with a virtual procedure called print, uh, and they have different glyphs. And then when you actually use it, you allocate things, but then you don't care what you print. So, so they have the basic concepts. It's a bit like the pet shop exp example that everyone's seen, so to speak. Uh, and then comes Strostrup, the Dane, the Danish half. So he wants to mix Simula or Simula 67 with C. So, so he started in 79 something called C with classes. Um, and in 85 he released this one, the C++ programming language, where, where we're very close to where we are today. Uh, this was updated in 89 and then a very slow progress until C++11 and since then we have date-based cadence of releases and from my perspective it's really come alive. The language is really moving forward and getting modernized and since you have all the metaprogramming a lot of what earlier went into the compiler goes into the standard library which means that you can prototype stuff in Boost that before required a new compiler. So it, it's, it's a lot easier to build new features. So, so very exciting that this has sort of regained traction. Um, anyone here coding Objective-C? I see a few hands, so, so correct me, because I'm not. Uh, but Objective-C comes from a different school. It's object-oriented C, but it's not from the Algol family. It comes from Smalltalk. Uh, which is more runtime oriented. So, so instead of letting the compiler making all the decisions while you compile things and link things, uh, you do all these things while running. So, so you pass messages between objects instead of making calls. And you can definitely pass a message to null pointer and, and it doesn't blow up because that's a valid thing to do at runtime. You can check if you pass it to, to someone uh, trusted. It has a completely different memory model. There's a Stack Overflow page with like a hundred differences, but it's it comes from a different object-oriented school. So it's a completely different way of thinking. Uh, so the common denominator is really C, but the OO model is different. Uh, so I wanted to to show something. Now I have the machine. I, I actually picked it up at lunch today, finally. So the reason for, for being here. Uh, but the very first C++ compiler uh, that Strostrup worked with was called CFront, which was based on something called CPre. Um, and CFront is written in C++, which is kind of interesting because it means that you have a bootstrapping problem. So it comes with sort of a pre-generated set of C files that you use to bootstrap to build the C++ compiler to then actually be able to build the, the C++ compiler proper. But this is more of a transpiler because it translates from C++ to C. It, it's not the full compiler, it's just the first stage. Um, I tried building this and it fails on the grammar rules. And I think it's because I use a Linux system and not a proper Unix system. And the only Google hit I found is in this language, which I suspect is Korean or Chinese. I don't know. I don't read it. But somebody else has tried and failed miserably with the same sort of environment that I do. Uh, so you probably need a proper Unix version of Bison to, to build this one. 
uh, and not the GNU version of it. Uh, this was abandoned in 93 because they couldn't add exception support. So it, it's an historically interesting piece of technology, but it, there are no modern compilers based on it. I tried the 1.0 release because I wanted to show the translation from rudimentary C++ to C and really see how the mapping is done. But yeah, if, if anyone can identify the language and tell me what it says, maybe we can make a step forward. Um, there are more similar attempts. Uh, I, I saw some Ubuntu users, so GTK users. Uh, who remembers Vala? Has anyone here coded Vala? I, I saw a hand and some weak memories. So I mean, that's another object-oriented framework. I mean, GTK is based on an object model called G-Object, which is basically object orientation, but in C. Uh, so you create a G-Object struct that you put your information in, and you really have to do all the magic things that C++ does by hand. Uh, and this is, of course, tedious. You end up with a lot of boilerplate code. It also has benefits if you want to do like bindings to other languages, because you can really peek and poke at the internals of the objects, which you can't do in C++, because that's compiler-specific. Mm. Uh, but what Vala does is it gives you a C-sharp-like language, which is then transpiled to C that relies on this G-object model. Uh, I think the GNOME community are progressing towards Rust these days, so, so I don't know how much this is used anymore. It, it seems semi-abandoned. Um, but yeah, we, we had the dark ages. Um, mid-90s, incompatible SDL implementations. This, this is the starting point of Qt, which I like a lot. Why do they have a queue list? Why don't they use standard list? Because different list implementations had different performance implications or different optimizations. They had to do their own basic data types because there was no portability between compilers and, and different sets of standard libraries. Uh, template support. Uh, Visual C++, especially when you, when you had a nice GCC at university and then you had to use Visual C++ at work, you really learned to hate that one. Um, so, so you couldn't use the full language scope. You had to know what part works and what did not. Uh, this is something we still have. Uh, are you aware of a project to compile the Linux kernel with the uh, Clang, LLVM? I see some nodding heads. It, I don't think they've still succeeded without having to patch the kernel. Uh, so there are still extensions and, and sort of different behaviors in the different compilers. The, the compatibility isn't perfect. And I mean, we haven't still agreed on a name angling standard. So, so it's hard to mix and merge different compilers. Uh, you have different CPU specific extensions to, to certain places. Uh, if we're looking back, do you remember the, the early x86 CPUs where you had not the 32-bit memory space. But then you really had, you had different types of pointers. And I shouldn't go into it, but it's, you had segments and then you can address individual bytes within the segments. But the segments overlapped. So you could have segment pointers and offsets that could hit the same physical memory. Uh, and you had to sort of decorate your code to say that this is a segment pointer, this is a full pointer, and this is only an offset pointer. And Oh my god, you could shoot yourself in the foot when you were 16 and trying to get a pixel quickly onto the screen because you wanted to do 3D. But I also think it was fun. We, we had more CPU architectures. I mean, many of these are around, but you don't see them in desktop computers. I mean, even Apple is x86 these days, which is boring, and everything portable is ARM, which is boring. You don't have the alphas. You, you don't see the powers and so on. You do. I mean, I really liked the 68K series. They had a really nice programming model, but you don't see them anymore outside of, well, old men <laughs> reminiscing. Uh, you had much more languages. So, I mean, it's, we, we have a lot of high level languages, but even when doing like systems programming and, and performance stuff, Pascal wasn't out of the question. You had Turbo, Turbo Pascal back in DOS. C, C++, of course, assembler was still an option because you could write assembler as a human, which you can't anymore because the assembler languages have been more made to fit the compilers. Uh, Fortran was fun. Uh, 
Fortran is an amazing language because the compiler never ever stop because it was made for mainframes that does batch programming. So, so if you ha halt halfway through, you've lost your time slot. So it just tries to compile the program and if you write something strange, it'll make an assumption and then try to push it through. Uh, and, so, and it doesn't have white space. So if you write for i equals something, it could be for i or it could be for space i. And whatever comes out is based on your surrounding. Um, I also think they passed pointers to uh, integers. So if you pass the number four to a function, you got the pointer to where it stored a four. So if you happen to change that four, all other calls to four would um, end up with a new number because it didn't have this pass by value paradigm at all. Super fun. Logo, I'm actually building logo for my kids now in Python. Uh, so basically a drawing language for running along with a little turtle and, and draw geometrical shapes. Prolog, so something completely different. It's, it's not functional programming, it's not imperative, it's like expert system teaching the computer knowledge. Uh, basic, I guess we, we still have Visual Basic and so on. Um, we also had a large number of compilers, which was fun. Uh, it caused a lot of pain, as I said, but it, it, it also had competition. So I mean, Borland C++ was big uh, for a while, and then when things turned 32-bit and Doom came and things, Whatcom was king all of a sudden. Uh, and now it seems like GCC and, and Clang are having a little battle, but it's still a lot fewer and a lot fewer vendors. We had more operating systems, now everything's POSIX. Um, yeah, and you could screw up really hard, but you could also make things a lot more interesting. You, you don't have to allocate a window and tell the operating system that you plan to do something and ask for permission. You can just change the memory address and it changes the color on the screen. So it's much more direct, much more fun. Uh, the same with audio. You just poke at the sound chip and hope nobody else does it at the same time because otherwise you will wake up your parents in the middle of the night. Uh, and if you want to measure time and optimize something, nothing else is running. So you can start counting your instructions in your cycles and really optimize. Um, there was, it was fun, but a bit more rudimentary. And then we start coming to, uh, to the transition between C and C++, which I found interesting when, when diving into this. I, I didn't know that this was commercially available. Uh, there was something called Think C. Uh, that had object extensions. And it's fairly obvious that these guys looked at what Sourcer was doing, but they didn't want to go all the way or didn't want to follow the standard. Uh, so this was a popular C compiler for Apple computers. Uh, and version three, version four, wa was reviewed. Uh, I think there's a link, yeah. There's a link to the article down here if you want to read the full one. But there are a number of things from C++ that wasn't implemented. So operating over, operator overloading, uh, some automatic constructions, creator and destructions, cons cons generations. Uh, public and private doesn't really exist, everything's public. Uh, and so then you don't need friends, there are no virtual functions, it doesn't do inline expansions. The double slash one line comment doesn't exist. You have to do everything with slash and stars. You can't do multiple inheritance. Um, but from, from a historical perspective, it's kind of interesting to see how the code looks. So it's a struct where you can have inheritance. You can have a superclass. Uh, but there's no private public. So I mean, it's just a struct. So the class keyword doesn't exist. Uh, the magic part is that you don't have to type def your struct to your class name. It does, it assumes that for you. So it's a lot easier to write things. So, so when you're actually using it, it kind of looks C++-ish. You can do a pointer to, uh, to an object instance. You can call a function on that object instance and so on. But then when you look at the memory management stuff, it's, it turns funky. So new is a function call, which I mean, if you write an allocator, it is a function call, but it doesn't introduce the, the syntactic sugar around it. Um, so it's kind of C++, but not really C++. 
and was fairly commonly used on the Apple. But how, how do you then experience all this fun? How, how can you crash computers and shoot yourself in the foot and see different <laughs> memory models and stuff? Uh, because, I mean, I took some photos and, and my wife said, are you really going to show them? So this is bubble bubble. It's amazing when you're a six-year-old and it's amazing when you're 38. You, you got to play it. Uh, but I have a little shelf. So I have the screen and then there's the Amiga, the C64, the Atari, the Atari 8-bit, the Apple, the Spectrum. <laughs> and it's a disease. I know it, but it's, it's good fun. And you spend more time on making them run than you actually do something with them, which is the frightening thing. But it's, it seems to happen with all generations. Some generations tend cars or mopeds, and, and we will tend computers, it seems. So there's an emulator called Basilisk. And I was planning to be super brave. So, so this is Basilisk, and we can sort of move around and you can get super frustrated that there is no scroll wheel on the mouse so, so nothing works as you're used to it. Uh, and you have this think C environment. Uh, no syntax highlighting, uh, but a monospace font at least. It, it kind of reminds me of, of a modern C++ development environment. And, and this one here is, is your different project files. You have the project concept and so on. So it's an IDE. You can look at your inheritance graph, really fancy. Uh, and then it's back to the 80s. So you can't really Google the errors because nobody else is stupid enough to try to build something. So, so when trying to build an object-oriented program, I have problems with missing symbols. And Google shows me nothing. And when I build the C example, the emulator crashes miserably on a, <laughs> on a broken stack frame. So uh, I can be brave and press uh, build and crash the emulator, but I can't show you a proper demo, unfortunately, which is very sad. But that really leaves us where we are today. We, we have three dominating compilers, I would say. We, we have the Microsoft part, we have GCC, and we have Clang, uh, at least on the major platforms that people see today. Uh, we have a standard language. We have a standard C SDL implementation. Code is movable, great. We still have some extensions and some oddities. And, and from my perspective, C++ is actually coming back. It's more and more popular, and, and we have more and more fields where performance is important. Embedded systems are becoming bigger and bigger, so you don't want to code them in pure C anymore. You want the support of C++. And while you have other industries where you really need performance, like FinTech and so on, where we're, well, I guess they came from COBOL, so C++ must be an upgrade. Uh, but it's coming back. I, I like it. it. There is some dynamic to the community. Uh, I have no clue what the time is, but that's what I had to say. So thank you. I have a question. Yes, you do. In the very early frame of the B language, there was the magical keyword water. I couldn't help. I haven't seen that before. Did we have a grandfather of ours? Let's have a look. Well, no, it can't be since it's no, because it only had one type, word. So I can I that uh, the original C++ design has also. It was removed at the last minute because of lack of compatibility with C. People were being afraid uh, that it would not be the default to int that C does. But Bjarne yeah, wanted it the first edition. But does <coughs> now I don't know this, but you could prefix integers in early C and said re register or auto, I think, <coughs> if it was supposed to go on the stack or not. Uh, could that be the keyword? I don't know. <laughs> auto used to be just not, it's, it's a local variable. It's not a global variable. OK, yeah. And then you could do register if you wanted it to be a local variable that really was in a CPU register, because you will use it a lot. Yep. Is it removed? <laughs> I have another hand. So, how many machines have you got at home? Too many. I, I don't dare count it. I mean, it, the problem is with these old machines that you need to replace. The biggest problem is batteries and capacitors. 
So the, all the electrolyte capacitors needs to be replaced, which is fun because it's actually components that are big enough to hand solder, so you can sort of feel brave and do electronics. It, because if you open something new, you can't even see the components these days. Uh, remove your batteries if you have old stuff, uh, because that could really wreak havoc. Uh, I have too many C64s. This is my, how do you say it, Bruks C64. So, so this is not the bread bin model, which is the more expensive one, but I guess there are six one well, this is another Apple, so seven ones in this picture. And I have a nice posh C64 by the, by the TV in the living room that just sits there to, to not be an Xbox. Uh, so at least eight. So I have a, a question about the Spectrum, because I have an old Spectrum yep. back at home. Is there a C compiler for it? it there was... I haven't used any, but I, I mean, it's, where do I find it? I mean, isn't it the Z80? It is. So this, one slide earlier? Yeah, okay, yep. So there is, but I haven't tried it. My keyboard is unfortunately dead. You can order them from, from the UK, but they're, they, they had a really shitty keyboard design, so they wear out. Which one? Uh, SDCC. SDCC. Yeah. Uh, yep. The small device. Uh, your history of C++ the 90s looks like a desert, basically, from uh, the jump from the early C++ standard to C++ 11. But what about all the part on the STL was developed there, the work on Stepanov? I actually don't know this, that part. From, from my perspective, it was more or less of a desert with, with bad compatibility. I don't know the development of STL in detail, apart from what's in Garner's book. Uh, there was some work in, in the early effort to standardize the C++ what became in 98, where they had a completely different type of uh, standard library, more Java-like. Uh, and then, thank heaven, someone discovered what Stefanov was doing, and we got the uh, same library. Is it Stefanov? Stefanov. Yep. That needs to be Googled before the, the Malmö show of this speech, then. <laughs> I think, uh, I forget the name, but he has a very nice presentation about uh, yeah, yeah, Sean Harris. Yep. Cool. I don't know if it's in 2018 or 2017. I've been programming Fortran for a long time ago, and I, I, there's a lot of worthless information from it. But, uh, one of the things is like every all variables is by default uh, implicit. You don't have to declare them because if the variable starts with a to H, it's a floating point. If it starts from I and forward, it's a default integer. And that's where we today get our uh, loop variables like int I. That's from four cool. because it's the <coughs> implicit integer from I, J, K, L, M. So I... when, when I started, I almost always wrote implicit noun was the first command you wrote because then you had to declare all the variables. But else it was, like you said, it was not passing by value, it was passing by reference always. So if you screwed up somewhere, you, in, in the function, you, you could crash it any other place. <laughs> I've only maintained Fortran code on my very first paid coding assignment. And the only memory I have is that I had a function with a, a lot of arguments. So I copied the subroutine declaration line and I moved it up. And I replaced all the, the declarations with my variable names. I forgot to change subroutine to call. And the compiler will always make its best effort to produce something. And I hunted that bug for like a week. And I was so stressed out because I was like 16 and feared for my life for failing this. So I, I don't have fond memories of Fortran. <laughs> Fortran 77 was the standard, yeah. Oh, approaching the next millennium. <laughs> cool. 
So thank you. Shall we grab some food?